Mix in the Dark. Hey, what's up? It's my Yang from Mix in the Dark. Happy New Year and 녀정형 치아. I hope that everyone was able to spend some time with their loved ones this holiday. My mom is still in the hospital. We spent Christmas FaceTiming her, and I am super appreciative of everyone who has sent some love our way, even though I'm dealing with something that is difficult at the moment. The show must go on. Before we begin, I want to give a quick shout out to Magic Mind for sponsoring this episode. Magic Mind is the world's first productivity drink, and you can check them out at Magic Mind. Co. Our first story of the year is the story of a 24-year-old boy who is struggling with a few different things. First of all, he's a Tunza or youngest son, which traditionally means that he has the responsibilities of taking care of the parents until they pass. For some, this is kind of like an unspoken burden. Secondly, it seems he has dunning, so he sees ghosts or spirits, and it affects his daily life. He mentions that for him to become a shaman, he will need to get married. And then third, he is a and so far, I've only heard this twice, once from my mom and now the second time from this author, that you shouldn't marry a mongvu because they get sick a lot. My mom told me that if you are a mongvu and are in general a horrible person, you will get through your sickness and live to be older. However, if you are a mongvu and are kind-hearted, you'll eventually die from sickness. My mom's mom is a mongvu, so she died in her early 30s, and I've actually never met her. I don't know how true this is and how this curse, I don't even know if it's a curse, but I'll call it that from lack of words, but how this curse came to be. Let me know your thoughts and if you've heard similar. I do want to give a quick disclaimer that this story involves thoughts of suicide and verbal abuse that may be triggering for some of our listeners. If this is something that you do not want to listen to at the moment, please skip this episode. I won't be mad. Please take care of yourself. Thanks for sending in your story. I just want to say that you write really well and I barely fixed anything. Please consider writing and illustrating a book about your experiences. I would totally buy and read. Please enjoy. To introduce the story, I must tell a little about myself. I suffered from depression and domestic violence. I'm a bipolar 24-year-old Mongai and the Thunza, or youngest son of a family of three brothers and seven sisters. Living in St. Paul, I take care of my parents while doing my daily routine, working two jobs, and ensuring that my parents have the best food. Like the saying goes, love them when they're still here, don't start loving them when they are gone. Anyways, let's start from the beginning. When I was younger, I was a loud and crying brat. I would go to school and cry when the room's atmosphere was too serious for me. Most teachers that were with me grew tired of my cries that they decided to have a teacher babysit me when I came to school. This was pre-K, and from what I remembered, everyone I looked at had weird faces on them. Sometimes it's scary and horrifying, sometimes it's calm and funny. I remember seeing a kid around my age staring at me with his wide, white eyes. His skin was dark blue like the blood cells in him had died off. I wouldn't know since I'm a kid, but looking back at it now, I didn't realize I just saw a dead kid. Anyway, this kid didn't speak nor do anything. He would just look at me, and for a few minutes, all we did was stare into each other's eyes. My babysitting teacher came by and tapped me on the shoulder to break me out of whatever trance I was in. I did, but when she tapped me, I cried and bawled my eyes out. That was my very first experience. As I grew older, I stopped seeing that boy around. My cries were cut short when I changed schools and entered elementary school. I became a kid who loved to play around. I would run at every corner, make paper balls and throw them around, and lastly, make weird faces to my classmates to make them laugh. I was sent to the office numerous times for disrupting the class. My scores from my tests suffered greatly since they were always at a failed grade. I suffered academically that I was tutored in English and math. When it came to history and mythology, I would change and become a totally different kid. My teachers would often tell me that they liked me best when I was learning about history and myth. It was like the once loud and energetic kid had finally grown tired. I kid you not, I was super into history and myth that I literally did better than all of my classmates in identifying mausoleums, artifacts, and historical places. 
When it came to mythological creatures, that was where I rocked. Learning about a minotaur, hydra, and garuda opened my eyes. I even thought to myself, who's the madman that came up with all of these? These are so cool. I remembered being in the school library looking for more books on mythical creatures until I felt something staring at me. When I faced that direction, I saw nothing, but I clearly felt a presence there. I closed my eyes and tried to imagine what it was. The thing I imagined had a dark cloudy body, like his body was made out of dark clouds that were all clumped up together. It had no hands or feet, both were replaced by what seemed to be a slug's head, countless slug heads. I freaked out and tried to open my eyes, but I couldn't. The thing approached me closer. I remembered imagining these sharp four-inch teeth coming closer and closer to me. A friend of mine tapped me, and I was finally able to break out of it. When I came to, the presence was gone. I later met a girl who I had a crush on, and she told me she couldn't date me because I was a voo. I didn't understand what she meant, and I just let it go. And to cut it short, I later proceeded through elementary school with pure luck, but till this day, I always wondered what that thing was. Whatever that thing was, though, it had changed me. I never smiled after that, nor was loud again. Although I was fascinated at the thought of maybe seeing it again, I never did. Making it to middle school, I became a loner to the point where I would never talk to anyone even when spoken to. Even the teachers found me too quiet for a kid that they were worried if I was being abused at home. I did not want to tell them anything about what's happening at home. At home, I was called Dutu and would often be told to go die by my dad at the time. For those of you who do not speak Hmong, Dutu means stupid son. He had suffered from his first stroke and had recovered from it, so I just let it go, saying that he's probably just not himself. When he verbally cursed at me, I would momentarily look to mom for help, but she wouldn't say anything and remained quiet. If she had protected me, she would have gotten yelled at. At least, that's what I understood at the time. As time went by, I somehow made it through. Middle school went by and once I hit high school, that's where things changed dramatically. I entered a Marine Corps ROTC class and was disciplined. I learned how to take care of my body and learned how to enhance my capabilities. I participated in many countless community services and events. Lord behold, I fell in love with a different girl only for her to later on tell me because I was a VU, she couldn't date me. What's with all these because I'm a VU thing? I shrugged it off because I was awestruck. And disappointed. I later on asked my dad and he would yell at me telling me why I didn't step up for myself. I just told him that it was just a small matter and immediately the go die card came out of his mouth. I stared at him as tears began to form in my eyes. I would ask him, do you really want me to die that much? Have you always seen me as a nuisance? Why do you hate me so much? He didn't answer me but was silent. I went into my room and played video games to calm my mind. Of course, I cried, but at least I know that he wanted me to stand up for myself and to be smart for once. Later that night, I dreamt that I was at the bottom of a mountain. This mountain was shaped like a pyramid which had white clouds covering it. The skies above were beautiful and the wind that blew around was calm. Tranquility at its finest. I looked back and saw that behind me was just the sea. I was somehow floating or standing on something. As I turned to face the mountain, a sharp pain grew in my eyes. I quickly wiped them, and when I came to, a dragon was resting with its body coiled around the mountain. It was a fairly large dragon with white scales and gold trimmings. It was like those Chinese dragons that I've always seen in paintings and on the internet. If a person would look upon it, it would prove to be intimidating to the person, but for some reason, I felt like I was at peace, happy. I wasn't scared at it, nor excited. I felt nothing except being at peace. I stood there until the sharp pain came back, making me blink, and when I did, I found myself to have moved up a couple of feet closer to the dragon. His snout was before me, and from what I could remember, he nodded at me. I blinked once more and found myself riding behind his neck as we glided over the skies. There was water beneath us, and above us were oddly formed clouds that moved slowly around. He didn't speak nor say anything, and I did the same. We both just enjoyed each other's presence. 
I later on woke up from that dream and pondered to myself that I wish that dream was real. It's so much better than this mad world I'm living in. Even though that plane would be boring, at least I could live peacefully. I attended school and later on began seeing shadows crossing by me through my peripheral vision. In ROTC, you are taught to use your peripheral vision to align yourself with the person to your right or left depending on where you were when marching. Marching helps the person to follow a set of directions, builds discipline and maintains the formation's morale, helping them get to one place to another. If one person was off sync, the squad, platoon or company would be thrown off. Therefore, cadence would be projected by the unit leader, which is the CO, XO, or any non-commissioned officers and above. Although in our ROTC class, we never really used cadence but the left heel to stay in sync. When marching, you are forbidden to freely look, which is why you had to learn how to use your peripheral vision. Enough said, I hated it. When I participated in competitions, I would always feel those shadows look at me. Sometimes they would approach me and I would be thrown off by it. They do that when I'm in the drill deck leading my unit, which annoys me and freaks me out because they do it in the most horrifying way. For the bashful ones, they peek around the corners. For the reckless, they either run up on you like they're going to rob you or they crawl like a spider towards you. Only one shadow does that to me and I call him Beggar Lee. He would crawl on all fours with his head facing up and he would crawl towards me sideways like a crab. This slows him down, but when he does crawl forward, he's fast. Another shadow that appears before me is a tall figure. I could make out the figure and the reason why it's so tall, because it literally has two heads, one stacked up on another. This one is one of the bashful ones that would peek at you through corners, windows, and in closets. Sometimes, if he really wants you to see him, he would stand out right where you could catch a small glimpse of him. The third one was a more relaxed one. She seems to be more laid back and only appears when I'm depressed or whenever I cry. When I do cry, she mostly appears on my left. Despite how scary it is, I feel her presence is heartwarming compared to the other two. This shadow seems to always wear red clothing like those Hun Fu dresses. Hey listeners, this is my Yang, and you all know that I'm a mother, teacher, and podcaster, which makes my life extra busy. I often have trouble sleeping at night because my mind is always making a list of things that I would need to complete the next day. And what doesn't help is I still have to wake up early to go to work. And because of this, I get very little sleep and my energy level is just not always there. So I've been trying to find a way to keep my energy level steady throughout the day, and I think I found a solution. Let me introduce you to Magic Mind. It's literally this little tiny shot of magic that I like to take in the evening time. And I'm not gonna lie, I had my doubts about this little drink and I really wasn't buying that it was a productivity drink because like how it's this little tiny bottle and I actually didn't realize that anything was working until my husband pointed out that I had been watching way too many movies so the thing about me is that I like to watch movies when I'm done with my tasks it's just a way for me to relax and he asked if I was okay um, and that kind of shook me because I was watching a lot more movies but that That meant that I had been completing my daily to-do list without any complaints. And you guys, this was during the week before winter break. And if you're a teacher, you know how busy and annoying every day is because you've got 26 little kids who are also excited for their break and they have no idea how to contain it. So most people take this in the morning for an extra boost. I actually like to take it during the evening time. I found that this shot has helped me to sleep a little deeper. I wake up with more energy and I do that in a more relaxed state of mind, which really helps me as I'm trying to get ready for 26 energetic little students. It's not heavy on caffeine, so you can take it in the after hours without worrying about not being able to fall asleep at night. It has many ingredients that are beneficial for your body, but the one that I like most is called Rhodiola rosea. It's a nootropic and an adaptogen that reduces fatigue and anxiety. It increases your body's resistance to stress, improves physical and mental endurance, and enhances mental clarity. Seeing how well it works for me, I would really encourage you to try it out as well if you're having trouble feeling 100% on some days. I have a 20% off code to share with you guys. It's MIX20, that's M-Y-X-20. And to use it, you just go to magicmind.co slash MIX, M-Y-X, and enter the code MIX20 at checkout. The best part is that they have a money back guarantee. And if you get the subscription, it's 40% off. My 40% off code only lasts 10 days, so you gotta hurry up. I'm also going to include the link in the description of this episode, so make sure you check it out. All right, back to the story. 
After seeing those things, I met an amazing friend who I called Natsu. She hated it when I called her that, but joked back, calling me old man. This flirtatious act, after occurring so much slowly, became the beacon of a new relationship. Natsu was more funny and demanding the more I got to know her. It secretly made me adore her to the point that I kind of understood the value of loving a person and wanting to be with them at every moment. She was a loud and cheerful person. If she spotted me frowning or sad, she would ignore everything and would come comfort me by saying old man. I would then lose my composure due to the way she says it. We later got into a relationship and when we did, the shadow in red appeared more frequently. One time, Natsu was sick and she couldn't really move. Since we lived close to each other about five blocks away, I made home porridge for her. Since I did not drive, I ran to her house at 8pm. I knocked on her door and one of our buddy was there gaming with her younger brother. I told him to give her the porridge I made, which she asked me, why can't you do it yourself? I shook my head and joked to him, a da was following me. He took it and closed the door. On my way back, I felt a cold breeze coming from behind me. Without looking back, I sprinted and before I knew it, I heard footsteps running after me. I took a quick glance, but I saw nothing. Puzzled, I stopped and when I did, the noise stopped too. The area around me felt so cold that my gut was telling me, it's behind you. If you turn, it will be behind you. I dare not turn, but instead ran across the street and then around. I believe that when you turn while standing in place, it makes your situation a bit unpleasant. So to prevent that, you would run around, but at a wide angle, to prevent you from directly looking back. I still heard footsteps, but as I approached my house, they began to trail off. After that night, I got sick to the point where I actually got skinny. I would mention it to Natsu that I got chased last night, and she would tell me to stop joking around. I agreed, and we spent time with each other at school. Our ROTC class held numerous trips such as NCO Offsite, Winter CLC, and so much more that Natsu and I kept building our bond through those. Spending time with her, even if it was just five minutes, made me really happy. Her lively personality and her lovely smile made me want her at my side. I still remembered how when we went horseback riding, she stayed about a horse distance away from me, and when I looked back, she made funny faces at me. She was shy after all, but a really loving joker. I cherished every moment of it. Later those days, we talked about making plans for the future and telling each other our wishes since I told her that I was a guy who's serious when it comes to a real relationship. I don't regret telling her that. She was the first I've loved and will always be the last, though the thought of it scares me because what if something happens to me? Surely though, nothing did, I am sure nothing will, because I will be happy for whatever choice she makes. My sisters often tell me that when I love a person, I tend to give too much of myself away. I tend to give my heart and soul to the person, but, like I told my sisters, why should I hide when I truly love the person? Graduation was right around the corner, and the older I got, the more frequent those three shadows appeared. It was like they were trying to give me a message of some sort. I was still sick while being with Natsu to the point where I found it weird how she recovered dramatically after that night. One night she texted me saying that she wanted to tell me something. I was happy and wanted to hear it so I waited. When she was available, she told me that we should break up because her parents don't like me being with her. She told me her parents said that Vu people get sick too much and that if we got married, she would have to take care of me. They didn't want their daughter to be with such a person and advised her to stop being with me. I didn't believe her words at first, but after getting rejected from two different girls because of my last name, it clicked in my head. Because I'm a vu. I'm guaranteed to be a nuisance. I'm guaranteed to be born to be sick and miserable. I didn't call her nor texted her after and accepted that perhaps it's better if she's not with a sickly person like me. She would try to call and text me, but I couldn't bring myself to answer her. It dawned on me that I was the problem of the relationship and that she probably had every right to break up. I told my second oldest brother and he yelled at me, telling me perhaps I deserved it. I couldn't answer him, but accepted that it was because of me. I continued with my life. I was no longer afraid of the three shadows, Beggarly the Crawler, Cao Ying the Shadow in Red, and Twin Heads the Stacked Head Shadow. Thinking back on it now, I know that I didn't love her enough. Surely if you love a person, you would do anything to be with them, but to me at the time, the mention of my last name really broke my walls from defending me. I was so weak that I only thought of surrendering instead of fighting and hoped for it to work, even if it was only 5%. Instead, I didn't respect her feelings and chose to give up. 
That is my confession. That night, it was hard to sleep. When you are heartbroken, tears will just come rolling out and before you realize it, it won't even stop. I was up until 3 until I begged my grandpa and grandma to help me sleep. And before I knew it, I slept. The dream I had was horrifying. I was walking down this dirt road with my parents and with my first oldest brother. We were dragging a cart of pandao to go sell to a nearby village, and as we walked that trail, we entered a plain where rice wheat filled both sides of the road. The road led to a mountain which had its lower half covered by the clouds. My dad in the dream told me that the destination was at the top of the mountain. I nodded to him and we continued until I spotted two pairs of dark blue feet sticking out on the left side of the road. In my mind, I knew what it was so I kept quiet. Yet, it was inevitable because my dumbass first oldest brother decided to shout saying, A dead person is lying over there. Once that came out of his mouth, the dead person who was indeed dead rose up from the ground. It didn't use its hand to get up, instead, gravity did the total opposite and helped lift her onto her feet. She turned to me with a smile and blood trailed down her mouth. Her hair wasn't covering her face, but was all on one side of her head. Small clumps of red jelly were stuck onto her hair as they slowly dropped to the ground, one at a time, as she hovered towards me. Yes, she was hovering, and with both her hands toward me like a Jiangxi. Her eyes were white with black pupils. She wore those mown dresses with a red sash that was hanging off her side. Blood trickled behind her as she got closer, and I could no longer feel my family's presence. Before I knew it, it was just me and her at the spot. I was paralyzed at the moment and couldn't move. The smile on her face grew wider and wider as a big clump of meat fell out of her mouth. Then she said to me, I will be your Nazi for you. For some reason, I got mad at her words and broke out of the trance. I remembered picking up a stone beside me and hitting her on the head with it. When she fell back, I woke from the dream, drenched in sweat. My room was cold to the point when I turned on the heater, it took an eternity for it to get warm again. As I sat there dumbfounded and creeped out, I saw a red arm drenched in blood moving in my closet. To set the scene, my room is in a rectangle. When you enter the room, you would see two windows in front of you about 20 arms length away from you. To the right of the window at the corner is my bed, which to the right of that are two small pairs of windows. These windows were six feet up from the ground and would always give me the creeps of what if something peeks through. They wouldn't be able to because on the other side, it's about 16 feet off the ground. And even if you peek, the blinds are covering it. I would be able to see shadows, but I would never be phased by it. Now for the closet, I sleep with my head facing towards the window and my feet are parallel to the door. My closet is actually where my feet are pointing at. As you can see, I have a really bad setup. Anyways, when I saw something move in my closet, I thought to myself, how can a person get inside? I locked my doors already. And then it occurred to me that even though my door was locked, they could still get through to my closet. My closet had no doors, but had a hidden passage on the top where it would lead to another spare closet, which was connected to the hallway of my house. If my room was locked for unknown reasons, I would have to climb up into that hidden passage, use that spare closet, and climb out of it. Of course, it wasn't an easy climb, but that would be the only way to get in. Frightened, I quickly got up and ran to the living room. I grabbed my dad's ritual sword and headed back into my room with it. It's weird because the thought I had in my head was, I'm going to get rid of you nice and slow. And so with that sword, I stabbed at my closet. My dad saw and was frightened, so he began chanting and spitting at the corners. I later sat in my living room and I could feel my spine actually being cold. Like it was a whole different part of my body and it was frostbitten. My dad later approached me and said that I looked scary when I stabbed my closet. I asked him what I looked like. He didn't answer, but simply walked away. Cao Yang, the shadow in red, never appeared again. After that, I went to work and once I was done with it, I found that my third oldest brother got into a car accident. A guy who did not have a license rammed into my brother from behind. They were both okay, but my third oldest brother left the dude off because he felt bad for the dude. My second oldest brother came to pick me up and he made a bet saying that I would get in trouble when I get home. When I made it home, I went into my room and sat in the corner holding my mom's picture. All I could hear was my dad saying that it was my fault that the car was ruined. My second oldest brother agreed with him, and instead of stopping him, he escalated it. I was sitting on the floor just crying from the words, he should die, and he doesn't deserve anything. 
my oldest sister came in and said, don't show him any mercy. I understood my fault here, but is there really a need to tell me to go die? Is there really a need to verbally say those things to me? Am I not human too? Do I not have your blood coursing through my veins? Do I not have the flesh you gave me? Yet, for everything I do, it's always go die. Many things came across my mind that the entity I saw as a child appeared in my mind again. I need to kill them, is what I hear. My nose bled from it, and before I knew it, I was holding a knife. My third oldest brother texted me, telling me not to cry, but it only angered me even more. You feel bad for the culprit, so you let him go. How dumb can you be? But regardless, I will be blamed for it anyways. The urge to hurt my family grew inside me. You would get a feeling of pure anger and hatred that for some reason it makes you feel stronger than the average human. Your mind will make you think that you can tolerate pain, but in reality you probably couldn't, but who knows. Fortunately for me, I didn't fall into temptation due to one thing. My tears fell into the picture of my mom, and when I looked at it, it looked like my mom was crying with me. I just cried myself to sleep holding her picture as they continued their talk. I later dreamed of the crawler and twin heads comforting me, telling me that it's okay and to keep living. The shadow in red appeared too, and she was a beautiful woman. She told me that she now forgives me and that I can choose to be happy again. So here I am today, taking care of them, paying the bills and working two jobs and making sure that they both have tasted the best foods out there. Knowing how I am, I could have been a murderer, but I chose not to. My second oldest brother became a shaman and matured. I later found out that I also have Da Ning and me from him and was told that I needed to get married if I wanted to become a shaman. I'm already playing the thing for funerals, so there is no need for me to do it. The best thing that I can do right now is just to take care of my parents. Until this day, my dad doesn't yell or curse anymore. He looks at me differently as if this time he's sad or depressed. I wouldn't know, but as the youngest child, I'll fulfill the role and take care of them the best I can. They're old now and could barely see at night, so I'll bear through it even though I really want to rest. Thinking back on the car accident, I still cry to myself here and there about it. As for the entity I saw as a kid, he's just me if I had done the duty. Thank you for listening to Mix in the Dark. I am your host, Mai Ying. Mix in the Dark is available on Spotify, Apple Podcast, or wherever you listen to your favorite podcast series. If you have a story that you would like to share, please send it to mixinthedark at gmail.com. If there's a story that you really enjoyed, feel free to hit up my tip jar on Venmo. Just search Mix in the Dark on the business tab.